put the next question to Sadhguru. Right now, Nassim shared an interesting insight. He said that all fragile, all that is fragile, is going to break and will disappear. Now, the first thing I thought about is, well, the, the most fragile element in all this are humans. We are the most fragile element. Are we going to be this element that is going to break first in this world where technologies are going to be here, where Elon Musk's, Musk and Google will put their satellites and Facebook would uh, put these satellites in the air? Will we be the species who will disappear in this exciting transitional world? And what piece of advice can you share with us, with us as humans? How do we adapt to this world? How do we remove that tension that we live in right now, this superfluous flow of information and all these concerns that we have? How can we address that? How can we adapt to that? How can we address anxiety? Because anxiety and depression is the world's uh, mo most popular disease, because now doctors uh, say that it is much more pervasive than uh, cancer and other diseases. What are we to do? Uh, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, <laughs> about uh, what is fragile will naturally collapse, of course. But what is fragile is not the human being but many structures that human beings have created in the form of nations, in the form of religion, in the form of companies, these things will collapse and it's a very good thing. When we say human being, we referred only to the human as a being. We did not say a tiger being, an elephant being, an ant being. We only said human being. This means we have a capability beyond our survival process. Our life truly begins only when our survival is taken care of. Till now, at least the recorded, vaguely recorded history of twelve to fifteen thousand years, we've been only struggling for survival. I believe the next twenty-five to fifty years time, the struggle for survival will be obliterated from this planet. That is when a human being will truly rise because that is when the competence of a genuine human being comes into play. And that is the most important time for the human being because you can truly be a human being. There was a time you would dominate the situation around you if you had the biggest muscles because physical force was everything. But then mechanical machines came and suddenly your muscles look ridiculous, then you started seeing how slim you can be. Today, how big a brain you have, how much computing power you have within your head seems to be the dominating factor. This will be meaningless in the next probably, you should tell me, maybe I'm thinking fifteen years time. <laughs> My timelines may not be right, you guys are the experts. but. Anything that you can do by collecting data, processing and expressing in different ways will be meaningless. Your silly little phone, I'm sorry, the smartphone will be able to do much better than you. Already it's beginning to. This Google lady is looking smarter than the oracle it's of the past. <laughs> I just ask, I'm in Coimbatore in southern India, I ask, what's the weather in St. Petersburg without batting an eyelid? She tells me within half a second, what is the weather in St. Petersburg? So, the right time for human beings is coming. This fear of who is going to dominate. This idea of dominance itself comes from a very poverty consciousness. This idea of dominance, why I should dominate is because what is available is limited, if I dominate, I get more, you get less. This idea 
will be meaningless in the next twenty-five to fifty years' time. Well, will there be some misuse? Well, with everything there will be some misuse, but the use will overpower the misuse in a huge way because nations will not determine what happens with the technology. Companies will not determine what happens with the technology. It is the consumer who determines what happens with the technology. Tomorrow's dominance is not going to be of nations or companies, but of individual people. When this happens, only when this happens, human genius will unfold like never before. We've been crippled by our survival being so difficult. When survival is handled effortlessly, everybody is wondering, what about my job? Isn't it a great day when you don't have to go to your job and you have everything that you need? Isn't that what everybody is striving for? Why is everybody trying to be rich? So that I don't have to go to work today and still I have everything that I need. This is going to be the way for every human being on this planet. If technology moves as rapidly as it should without obstructive regulations and other stuff that can be done by certain governments. But this idea of national boundaries will be meaningless. I walked into the Google office some time ago, a couple of years ago, and if you look at this, you don't know in which country you are. It doesn't look like United States. There are Indians, there are Chinese, there are uh, African people, there are every kind of people there. You don't know in which country you are. And that is going to be the future of the entire world. You don't know in which country you are. They won't look one way, they won't speak one way. In whichever language you speak, you're speaking Russian, but I'm perfectly understanding, which was never possible. So from the times of Genghis Khan to nineteenth century America, we've always thought of how to enslave people. I must tell you this, the most ancient civilization on the planet, which is the Indian civilization, always thought of how to liberate people. Even today, the highest value in the yogic system is liberation. Li how to liberate people has always been the way. I think this is not going to be a fringe idea. This is going to become the mainstream. The sooner the better, I hope I will get to see it. If you're afraid technology is moving fast, I'm afraid that it's moving too slow. Will I be around to see that day when everybody can focus on their liberation, not on their survival? Everybody can see how to unleash their human potential, not about controlling themselves or other people are not seeing how to control you because our structures of na nationhood, our structures of religion, our structures of racial identities, our structures of my company versus your company always demanded that we must control people, otherwise we cannot succeed. But a time has come now, if I give you something, if you can multiply this into a million times, that is success. Controlling you is not the success, liberating you is the success, so on the, in the transitional period, of course, there will be upheavals, but upheaval means just this, those when in India, when the, you know, the privy purse for the Maharajas were taken away, people thought a great strategy, tra tragedy has struck the country because the Maharajas went away. Those who dominated for hundreds of years, lived in palaces, all uh, gold-coated uh, toilets, they're gone, aren't we glad they're gone? So similarly, those who are dominating right now may be gone. This doesn't mean human possibility is gone. I feel if technology does everything that we are doing right now, we are on a holiday of exploration. <laughs> it's a real great world. Why should we be striving for survival <laughs> like other creatures? Okay. Спасибо большое. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that optimism. I'm sorry, dear colleagues, we have a very tight schedule. I'd like to put another question to Maxim Akimov, our speaker. 
1957, when the Soviet Union launched a satellite in space and the U.S. understood that they lag behind. And in the U.S., they had this term, Sputnik moment. The term was coined, the moment when the U.S. had to put up all the forces, all the potential uh, to demonstrate that they are on the par with the Soviet Union and they were the first to launch people to the moon. So I'd like to put the question to you. What in today's world will be a Sputnik moment for Russia when we will gather our, join our forces, jo join our strength, and uh, will make such a disruption like the disruption that the U.S. did that back then. And uh, your appointment of uh, vice uh, premier, uh, vice prime minister, uh, you're responsible for digitalization. And uh, will your appointment mean that you will uh, make this disruption? Well, I, I'm an optimist. I hope that I will try to do my best, but I think you are a little bit too optimistic about my appointment, perhaps. But by, uh, uh, I'd like to ask this the question to the audience, to use my privilege. 109 applications in my smartphone, that's what I counted. Could you please tell me who, well, I'm not talking about 109, but five, not 500. Have you read user license agreements from start to finish? three times uh, for three applications one hand in, in the last three years one hand and I, I don't read them as well and you know it's not that we are um, that we procrastinate we're not smart we understand what is written there but we understand that this, this is not rational and we cannot really select this is a new force the new market uh, domination that you don't know what to do about. And this is the example from the set of other challenges that are related to uh, cross-border character of data to the fact that uh, the national state cannot control the algorithm uh, that is used to uh, collect, process, and monetize this data. Or it is very hard for the government to do that. Well, I'm not talk about the examples. We know about them. We know about these cases. The set of these challenges it means that this Sputnik moment is here. And it is quite obvious. I'd like to return to my point of optimism. This Sputnik moment tells us that the world is changing so rapidly that we do have these windows of opportunities. Well, who actually knew about the existence, I mean knew, like knowledge, who knew about the existence of Japan before, before major revolution? Well, like two or three missionaries who ended up badly, by the way. Now, uh, before Korea was, uh, was uh, divided, who was the richest? The North, North Korea was, was the, the was uh, the, the the largest one, and Samson was selling fruits and vegetables. And there are many changes. There are many examples of such rapid changes and dramatic changes. And now these cases are going to be much more rapidly unfolding. That means that our main challenge, our main objective, is to implement the true adaptability. So um, thanks to you, Mr. Graf. And thanks to other enthusiasts of uh, committed to project management and other innovations uh, of management. You know, this is an industry we're talking about. And now we say project management. Is it an adequate tool? Because the architecture is changing quicker than we uh, put the milestones in our project management exercise. And so the major challenge is how to ensure this adaptability because from the technology point of view we understand what to do i mean the regulations in terms of uh, data management investment in humans because digital revolution is not about P uh, it it's about culture and people it is more f it should be more focused on culture and people 
although the yes the authorities they do love digital infrastructure and data centers they focus on this and well obviously we need that but humans are in the center and education is another uh, item high on the agenda. So uh, by answering your question, I think that the key, the key challenge is the true adaptability. To be able to be much different, to change dramatically in 12 or 18 months, to be in the moment, to be in line with all these changes. So, so the Ministry of Digital Development, uh, this is a topic that is much discussed. You know, this digital agenda that should appear. Now, five years ago, it was uh, discussed in St. Petersburg. I mean, five years ago, we had it in St. Petersburg, this digital agenda, but it was kind of marginal, so to speak. You know, five years, we, we thought about that differently because 10 year period for a, for a state management, for a government, for governance and for the society, you know, this is a very short period of time. But I would like to share some optimistic thoughts. I think the, the, the most important value and ideology that we tried to promote in the previous cycle, this is the uh, engaging business and people in terms of digital transformation. This value should remain. But obviously, uh, the number of challenges, the list of challenges have not become shorter. So perhaps this is a kind of a helicopter view of this uh, of this idea of this digital agenda, uh, how to regulate data, how to build infrastructure. What should we do in the education area? What should how should should we address key technologies? You know, this is not the central challenge. How to change? How to adapt? This is the central challenge. Yes, thank you, thank you um, so much for that. Yeah, I would like, by the way, to invite you to our Sberbank business breakfast, and uh, we are going to answer the questions how to change. We do not have much time right now, dear colleagues, but we do have some time to have to uh, ask some questions and to get the answers from the panelists. Oh, yes, uh, you, you rose the hand first. Come on, quicker, quicker, girls. We don't have time. Come on, just, just, just run. It's, it's good for your figure. Hello, Krilov Ivan, Aces Company. Who is the question to? Well, perhaps this question is to all the panel. You can't, you can't have all the panel answer it. The Meyer brand, perhaps. Mr. Meyer, Elon Musk said that the key element in the interaction of humans with artificial intelligence is the brain-computer interface. In light of the breakneck development of technologies. How do you see the PCIs, the brain-computer interface? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, the question. Um, I think like, like Peter said, um, artificial intelligence is not going to uh, replace humans. And, um, and, and even my friend here, um, our yogist friend, I think when we really think about what, what we want technology to do for us as human beings, um, how will it release us? And how can uh, machine learning and AI help the burden of technology release us and free us? The idea is that technology takes away the stuff that we hate to do in our lives. The scheduling, the logistics, the earns, all the stuff that we constantly need to do, the sending email and reading all the emails, etc and leave us as much time to live our lives, to love, to create relationships. This is, for me, what the vision of machine learning and AI behind technology, this is what it should be. Now, whether it will be that way is yet to be seen. But I think that should be the promise. It's not about replacing people. It's not about replacing the brain. It's about letting us do what only we can do and letting the machines do what they do better than us, and usually we also don't like to do it. Okay, okay thank you very much. But uh, as we have invested in upgradation of technologies, we have not invested time, energy, resource, 
to upgrading individual human beings. If we don't do that, the negative will overtake. The tools that are given to us can be used whichever way. Technology doesn't have a mind of its own. We can use it this way or that way. So what kind of human beings are we going to produce is very important, so that investment also should happen. Please, your question. Right, please take my microphone. Hello. Hello. Alexander Chernobyl, Rare Earth magazine. My question is to Sadhguru. Sadhguru, thank you. Yeah, right. My question is this. You speak about the most important thing, the change of the human state of a human, the human condition of people. You are saying that we need to change spiritually as we grow technologically. If we fail in that, that will essentially become the slaves of our technologies. Am I, am I correct in saying that? Lee. Okay, thank you. Should we stay as human beings or we will change completely? Thank you. Uh, now. <laughs> but it is in the nature of the human being, wherever you are, whatever you are, you want to be something more than what you are right now. If that something more happens, immediately you want to be something more and something more. If you look at this, there's an innate longing in every human being to expand limitlessly. If you want to expand limitlessly, we clearly know physical dimension is not the way to do it because the nature of physicality exists only because of defined boundaries. So the moment you realize that more is not going to fulfill you, all is what you want. If all is what you want, you have to transition yourself from the physical to what is beyond the physical. When I say this, right now we're sitting here, everything physical about us is accumulated from outside, the food that we've eaten. But there's an intelligence inside of this. We unfortunately have limited ourselves till now to the human intellect, which largely functions on data, that is why our technology, that is what our technology friends are trying to make it obliterated from our lives. That the machines will do all those things where you collect data and do things. Till now we've been only intellectual, but there is an intelligence within us which is capable of transforming a piece of bread into a human being. So this dimension of intelligence is what when human beings, individual human beings access, suddenly they look like extraordinary beings. When all data processing is handled by machines, this is where humanity will move. It's very important that we actively invest in this. In terms of time, energy, resource, we invest that individual human beings blos blossom into a possibility beyond memory. Right now, everything we're doing is memory-based. Our education, our spirituality, our religion, our everything is memory-based. We have to move from that because everybody has their own ideas about creation and their God and works. But essentially, because you don't have an explanation for how all this happened, you have come to some term of your own. But if you pay attention to a piece of creation, all you will see is, it's a phenomenal sense of intelligence. But nobody ever said, God is intelligence. People said God is love because they're desperate in their life. They did not find anybody to love, so they're looking upward. But a time will come now that we will recognize intelligence beyond data, intelligence beyond memory becomes the prime of the future human existence. And the quicker it happens, the quicker human potential will be realized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the last question, please.